yeah, before we start, I want to talk about how we can, um, how you can stay up on everything. I've gotten a few notes that indicate that um, Canvas is hard to follow. And I tried to make it as easy to follow as possible, but I know that, you know, like when you're, you know, like pushed for time, it can be difficult. So let me walk you through a few things. This is our Canvas homepage. This is where you'll end up if you, once you click on the dashboard. And I will keep the most current modules here. I don't want to have all, eventually we'll have 16 modules. And I don't want to have them all there. So I'll keep the current ones. Um, you can always go back and look at any other modules from right here. Um, and then the most current announcements will be, um, will be right there. Um, but you, this is week three. And because we're online, because we're meeting once a week, most of our material is on Canvas. And um, so this is the week three page. And if you wanna not get confused, start at the first page. I'll give you a little bit of introduction, you know, like what we plan to accomplish this week and all the assignments for the week will be listed here. And then you'll see this next button and you can go there. Now this one, this is where I'll post the video from today. Um, and then you'll have a quiz that you take afterwards which is right here. Um, and then go down to next and you'll find the other, um, the reading that is for this week. And that reading will be included there. And then there's a, an assignment. In fact, the quiz and this reading journal are due this evening. Um, and then again, of course, if you walk through next, um, you'll see that we have a reading from They Say, I Say, The Moves That Matter in Academic Writing. By the way, if your book has not come in, you can Google They Say, I Say and PDF, and you will find a copy um, on the internet. And then of course the discussion board, the initial post is due on Thursday, and the responses to other people are due on Friday, and then the Reflection Direction Journal, and should have been a wrap-up page, but it appears that I did not make that available. So, any questions about, um, any questions about how to, um, find the things that you need to find or be organized um, through Canvas. Okay. I will try and keep it as organized as I can. I know I had some huge messes. I had imported some assignments. They got imported twice. Um, I appreciate you all letting me know that that's what happened. Uh, well, you didn't know what happened, but you saw, you know, do I have to do this twice? I already did this. So sometimes you entered your assignments twice. I'm very, very sorry about that confusion. I think I've gotten it um, resolved and hopefully we don't have any of that happen again. So um, today I wanna focus on, um, on rhetoric, but before we get started, um, I want to give you an opportunity to tell me what you think about when you heard the word rhetoric. Now, how we're gonna do this is on your device, go to menti.com. Whoops. On your device, go to menti.com and enter this code. 
and it will allow you to um, see this screen and you'll have an opportunity to put what you think of when you hear the word rhetoric, okay? So go to menti.com, let me move my head down, and enter what you think of when you hear the word rhetoric. You'll be able to enter three different words or phrases. Good. I think we'll see a few more come in. There are about oh good, convincing, importance, tone, reasoning. Anybody else? Okay. Oh, but wait, there's more. Oh, I love movement of the soul. That's one of my favorite. Different ideas information yeah i see that it looks like we have one two three maybe four or five different versions of persuasive persuasion yeah that seems to be the most common one and and i like that you all are thinking about that because that really is an important concept persuasion um how much have you studied rhetoric in the past in high school amanda have you studied um rhetoric in the past i did a little bit like in my English classes, like we would talk about it like in writing, like with the logo ethos and the papers. Yeah, um, we'll talk about those today. Um, Carlos, did you study much about rhetoric in the past? Uh, no, in high school, not as much, to be honest. Yeah, I think it depends on the school you go to. Um, how long ago you went. Um, I had never heard about um, rhetoric when I was in high school. That just wasn't something we talked about. Persuasion or focus on audience. Um, yeah, and so um, Gabriel said he'd never heard of it. Um, but Alejandro has studied it. And so we all have these different backgrounds in rhetoric. But I think that what we're talking about today, for those of you who have studied it in the past, either a little bit or a lot, this will be a refresher, refresher and prob will probably add to what you've discussed. And for those of you who maybe haven't studied it before, I want to give you some information. Um, to give you a better background on it because we'll be looking at you know like 
how authors use rhetoric and rhetorical principles, rhetorical appeals, rhetorical strategies um, in their writing. And we'll also be talking about ways we can use it in our writing. By the way, rhetoric isn't limited to writing. We can see it in art, we can see it in speeches, we can see it in films, in poetry, in architecture. Um, rhetoric is everywhere. Um, and when we become more aware of it, then um, we can think about it and maybe people who are using those strategies on us don't have so much control over us. So let me switch, let me do a new share and um, go to our PowerPoint. And um, yes, there is me, Wednesday. And um, we're gonna define rhetoric. Um, I also want to talk about what an argument is and what ethos, pathos, and logos are and how they work. And if we have time, I have a final group activity for you. Um, how many of you have, um, how many of you have already read Callie Lynn for? Um, Okay, yeah, just put up your hand or you can use the little, um, you can put it, that in the chat um, or you can use the reactions at the bottom and raise your hand. One, two, three, four, five. Uh, it looks like a more, maybe more than that most of you have already read this. So. Um, let me go back to the screen and let's talk about um, talk about rhetoric and then hopefully we'll have time to do the activity on Kelly Lynn for. So um, uh, there, what is rhetoric? Blah. Um, I didn't see anybody put a lot of you put persuasion which means that somebody is trying to get you to think something, get you to agree with them, get you to think something's good, something's bad, something you should do something. Um, obviously we see rhetoric a lot, this attempt to change somebody's mind or make them think that way more clearly um, we see that a lot in politics. We see that a lot in advertising. Um, we see it everywhere. And that concept that somebody wants us to think, that's an argument. And so rhetoric is often associated with argument. Argument is a reason or a set of reasons given with the aim of persuading others that an action or idea is right or wrong. We want somebody to think the way, if we're the speaker or the writer, we want to communicate in a way that gets somebody to think something um, that might be different one than what they thought before. So we can also define it as an author's main assertion um, in a text, it would be the main idea in a text. E. Shelley Reed had an argument. And if we wanted to word that, um, we would start that. If we were describing her argument, we would start a sentence, E. Shelley Reed argues that and we would fill that in so she had 21 pages 23 pages a lot of pages but it was large text and it was all about writing and how to write but she had one main idea and i want to put you in breakout groups and i want you to start a sentence, 
come up with a main idea, start a sentence, E. Shelley Reed argues that, and, and then finish that sentence with her main idea. Ezekiel, you would definitely, I know that if we get to Kelly Linfor, you're gonna stay out of the breakout rooms, but you definitely wanna go into them um, this time. Um, so let's get five breakout rooms. Um, that's three to four of you in each room and go. You're gonna say, E. Shelley Reed argues that blank. Come up with her main idea. Make note of which room you're in. Okay, so what, how did you word that sentence? Somebody from group number five. How did you word that sentence? Uh, which oh, sentence again? E. Shelley Reed argues that I'm not 100% sure on what she argues, but it seems to be something like it's I what I got from it. She was giving like a bunch of like tips and tricks and like tips and tricks about writing and like rules and how writing can be like doable. Yeah. Um, so if that's what she's doing in the text. She's providing trips tips and tricks i like the way you word that Esteban, um for writing to show how it can be doable so those are the main things she's doing in this text what would her main idea be somebody from group four if you were to word that into one sentence what are those trips Tips and tricks, what are they doing? What's her main idea? She argues that. She's so like college students how to write better. Okay, so that's what she's doing. But if you say she argues that, what's her main idea? She argues like about the importance of rhetoric and how college kids should use it. If this is what she's arguing about, um, and we want to word it a different way. So it's one sentence that is her main idea. Um, did any group come up with a sentence that was her main idea, not she argues about? I think it's really important to know the topic. I think it's really important to know what she's doing in the text. Um, so I really liked what group five came up with, but we also have to get that main point into a sentence. Ezekiel? One of the, I think one of the main points was that um, E. Shelley Reed argues that we as uh, the writer should not write for the interests of our professor instructor, rather we should write about things that interest us as, as the author. I think that those, um, that's definitely part of what she's talking about. And we could say those are some claims she makes that fit together with the main idea. Let me show you um, what I put for the argument. And this will give you an idea of what I mean by argument. E. Shelley Reed argues that although writing will always be difficult, 
when we write for real people and think about what they will need in order to understand our ideas, we will figure out ways to do it. So one sentence that sort of collapses the whole idea, the whole text into, yeah, one sentence that just collapses the whole article uh, that summarizes it, the main idea. And it can be really hard to find the main idea, but I'm guessing that when you read this, you go, oh yeah, I knew that, because she really did communicate her main idea. Um, so when I think of Callie Linfor's text, I want you to think about, you know, like, what is her main idea? You know, like, what is the main thing that she wants her readers to take away? Because that, that connects with her purpose. E. Shelley Reed has this argument, and her purpose is to make students not so nervous, to give them tips and tricks that will help them. So her purpose is to give them tips and tricks, but her argument is that writing will still be hard, but if we keep our audience in mind, we'll figure out how to do it um, instead of focusing on rules. So questions about arguments or main ideas. Okay. So let me put that argument statement into other words. We should know about what we're writing, who we're writing for, what they care about, what thing, kinds of things appeal to them, and what kinds of concerns they have. We need to know our audience. We need to know what we want to say and what matters to us. And we need to know how we want our audience to respond. And we really should respond to what they care about. We need to give them concrete examples that includes things they can relate to and pay attention to their concerns. All of those things. And when I read what you wrote about E. Shelley Reed, that's what I heard is that you were surprised because you felt like she was talking to you. Um, one of you in maybe in this class or the other class, you wrote, it was like she could read my mind. And yeah, that's what she's doing. Um, it's like she's anticipating what you, her primary audience, would be interested in, concerned about, or care about. E. Shelley Reed says when we do that, when we pay attention to the audience, and not just rules, when we write about things that are passionate about us and we really have a purpose, our writing will have a fighting chance of being real, not just rules. And that's when writing gets interesting and rewarding enough that we do it even though it's hard. She also said that when we follow those three main principles, write about what we know about, we care about, um, what we're passionate about, we show, don't tell, um, and we adapt to audience and purpose, we are writing rhetorically. It's about the author and the audience. Author's purpose, author's main point, the audience, what they care about. I'm not able to, I can see when a question goes up in the chat, but I can't actually see it unless I stop share. Um, can somebody ask that question um, aloud? I was just asking if uh, the Zoom call or the Zoom meeting is gonna be recorded. Yes, it is being recorded. Okay. Yeah. Um, Aristotle, says basically the same thing as E. Shelley Reed. 
He says rhetoric is the ability to determine the available means of persuasion. It's like, what does my audience need? What are the possibilities? What are the types of things I can do? The examples that I can choose? Which ones, what is available to me? And what are the best ones if I wanna change my audience's point? Richard Weaver says rhetoric moves the soul with movement that cannot finally be justified logically. It seeks to perfect people by showing them better versions of themselves. And Kenneth Burke says the reverse is also true, that the basic function of, he says, most characteristic concern of rhetoric is manipulation. And yes, we see this a lot with ads. We see this a lot with politics. So rhetoric can be used for good reasons, to help people be better, and rhetoric can be used to manipulate people. Both things are true. And, and that means that it's a good idea if we know we can recognize when rhetorical ideas are being used with us. By the way, I'm using rhetoric right now. I want you to care about this. You can tell I'm passionate about rhetoric. I'm passionate about writing. I'm passionate about students. And I definitely want you to see why this matters because I'm trying to persuade you to care. Now, in some cases it might work and in some cases it won't, but that is my goal and my purpose. So I don't wanna hide anything. So how does rhetoric work? The author or the speaker or the artist communicates in a way that connects with the audience using word patterns, stories, evidence, metaphors, emotional language, comparisons, logic, statistics, images, and more to produce audience responses that make the author or the speaker or the artist's main point, the argument, seem more reasonable or more persuasive. That is how it works. So Aristotle observed three main audience responses. And these are called rhetorical appeals. So these are things that some of you have heard of. If you've never heard about rhetoric before, you might not have heard these terms, or you might have heard them in different ways. Ethos, pathos, some people say pathos. Um, or logos. Um, what do you know about these things? Anybody can. Um, um, Ezekiel, what do you know about one of these appeals? I have a feeling that ethos was used to to define or to to be as a character. Like Shelley Reed, you were talking about how she how did she use ethos. How did she build character for, for, uh, for her readers to trust her? So it's like building character. Yeah, it's build, building character that makes us trust her. Um, so that character and trust are combined. Um, what about pathos or pathos? Anybody remember what that one is about? Pathos was like the more emotional kind of persuasion. Yeah, um, where the author or the speaker gets the audience to feel emotion. Um, sometimes um, a politician might give a speech and make people feel afraid. And because they feel afraid, they might make they might do something, they might vote a certain way, they might support a candidate. And so that fear or that anger can actually be used to induce actions. Um, Barack Obama, who was president most of your lives, um, if you're youngish, um, he wanted to inspire in his 
campaigns, he wanted to inspire hope that things could be different. And so hope and change were his slogans. And um, apparently he did that because he was elected twice. And so enough people were in, they felt hope. And hope is an emotion just as fear is an emotion. Um, how about logos? I think it's like kind of persuading somebody using like statistics or like just facts. Yeah, that's definitely part of it, Gabriel. And we'll talk a little bit more about that. In fact, we'll talk a little bit more about all of these things. So ethos is the trustworthiness of the author or the speaker. Somebody tell me, why is it important that we see an author or a speaker as trustworthy? To know that you have like a reliable source or? Yeah, and what if they don't seem trustworthy? Yeah, Ezekiel? Um, if they don't seem trustworthy, then they're definitely not knowledgeable in the subject that they're writing about. So it can be hard to trust what the, the, the literature that they wrote. Yeah, it, if, if we don't trust them, they're probably not gonna persuade us. Um, if we do trust them, we might be persuaded. But if we don't trust them, why would we even believe them? And so Aristotle said that there are five ways that authors can develop a trustworthy character. One is to seem knowledgeable, but that's not the only one. You've all had teachers or professors, or you've encountered people who seem like they know a lot, and you still don't trust them. And so Aristotle's idea was that it should be some combination of these five things. They seem knowledgeable. They seem like they share the audience values or experiences. They can relate to them. They seem concerned for the audience. They seem fair or objective. We're more likely to trust people who seem objective or they just seem good. And as I'm thinking about E. Shelley Reed, in her very first paragraph, she seems knowledgeable. She's a writer. She teaches writing. She's come from a long line of people who write and teach writing. She seems knowledgeable. And she sh shows that knowledgeability throughout the text by writing really well. Um, she shares the values or experiences of her audience. She goes, yeah, I put my fingers on the keyboard and I think writing is hard. And so if the audience feels like writing is hard, which most of us do, we feel like she understands us. She shared our experiences and she continues to do that throughout the text too. And she seems concerned for her audience of first year students for the challenges that they're facing, you know, like when they have a time test and they freak out. She seems genuinely concerned for her audience. And so those are three of these characteristics that Aristotle um, described that Shelley Reed um, shows very, very obviously. Any questions about um, these five characteristics of ethos? So pathos, this is when an author does something in the text that makes us feel an emotion. And when we think of emotions, we think of sadness, anger, fear, happiness, but there are a lot of different emotions. Think of emotions. This is a whole range of emotions. 
think of a range of emotions. Um, some that you, yeah, just come up. Um, yeah, share an emotion. Amanda, what's an emotion? Happiness. Happiness. Um, Daniel, an emotion. Anger. Good. Um, Lori, an emotion. Sadness. Yes. Um, Taylor. Uh, thankfulness. Yeah, that's good. Um, yeah, definitely. Audrey? Um, discontent. Ah, uh, yeah. Um, Gabriel, an emotion. Um, they kind of like, I, I was thinking of two and then they both already have been said. Um, I don't really know. Okay. Um, Ezekiel, an emotion that hasn't been named. I'm going to say fear. I, I, I didn't okay. hear that it was already covered. I know. Those are, these are, these are emotions. Think of emotions that you might feel when you're watching a funny movie. Um, Andrea? Um, like surprise? Yeah. Um, another one. Jose? Hopeful. Good. Um, Elizabeth. Um, one could be confusion. <laughs> yes, definitely. So, so we've got a whole range of emotion, gratitude, thankfulness, confusion, fear, hopefulness, surprise, shock, um, discontent, disgust, and it goes on and on. Even intrigue, interest, those are emotions that we can feel. And so um, a sense of humor where we go, oh, um, mirth. Um, there are a lot of emotions that people can feel. And authors can weave those in as they're reading. Um, you can also have aha moments. You're like, oh, um, that feeling of accomplishment or pride, guilt. These are all emotions. And when authors are doing something in the text using comparisons or metaphors, descriptions, comparisons, they often want you, an audience, to feel an emotion. And so developing awareness of how you're responding to a text and also thinking about how the primary audience might respond to it can be really useful. Now, a lot of times we think of evidence as logos. And it's not exactly the same thing but it's related to it. So um, statistics, data, um, quotes from authorities, appeals to authority, those are related to it. But I want you to think of logos as logic or reasoning that makes the argument seem true. So, Another way to do this would be, you know how E. Shelley Reed talks about the fruit jello versus plain jello, or just bringing a bowl of cherries and dumping them out at a potluck? So let's think of, and she compares the cherries, those random cherries with pits in them, to the evidence. If an author just throws in a lot of evidence, but doesn't explain what to do with that evidence, that's like bringing the fruit without an explanation of what to do with it. But if an 
if somebody just brings a plain jello to a potluck, people go, hmm, that's kind of boring. And so if somebody wants to make the jello fancier, they put fruit in it, whipped cream, maybe layer it. It looks interesting. Put a few mint sprigs at the top. Those are the fluffy things. And, but they make the fruit make sense. So it's that balance of fruit and, and jello or the balance of evidence and arguments that create logos. Logos is the logic or reasoning that make the argument seem good. And that will be very important. Um, when you approach this first essay that I'll give you the prompt for next week, um, you'll see that I will ask you to, to, show, to share stories about yourself. But if you just tell a story, if <laughs> I can't talk, if you just tell a story, but you don't tell why it matters, then it's just a story about you. You have to have the story and why it matters. Your story will be evidence of why it matters. So um, we'll talk about all of this more later. Um, right now, I want you to remember that each of our authors is trying to persuade you of something. And so, you're gonna think about who is the primary audience? What do you know about that audience? What is the author's main point and what is their purpose? And what are they doing in the text to persuade their primary audience? That's really, really valuable. Um, that audience response is the rhetorical appeals. Ethos, pathos, and logos, they're all about the audience and the audience responding by trusting the author, um, feeling an emotion, or saying, aha, I get it, that makes sense to me. Those are rhetorical appeals. Rhetorical strategies are something very different. Rhetorical strategies are the things that an author does in the text to make the audience experience those appeals. So when um, E. Shelley Reed gives examples, like the mind reading conference or the little green ball or the jello or the pink house. Those are all examples. That's a strategy called exemplification. Comparing one thing to another, comparing the fruit or plain jello to arguments and evidence, that's a strategy. So we have 10 minutes. And let's go ahead, since most of you have read E. Shelley Reed, let's go ahead and um, do this. We're going to do a presentation, but in this time, I'm going to have you share the presentation. I'll put this in the chat. And so here's the first slide. Any of you can add an image, but we're all going to share the same presentation. And so if you're in group one, you will add your names to the bottom of the slide. And I want you to come up with one thing each or Kelly Linfor learns and how she learned it. She learns a lot of things in this text, okay? All right, questions about what we're gonna do? So there is the link to the Google Doc, and I'm gonna put you in breakout rooms. I think a few of you have joined us, and so I will put you in a breakout room, okay? Um, 
open all rooms. Michael, I'm going to assign you to group five. So Ezekiel, let me pause yeah. 